Greetings, fellow learners. Now, before we get into this luring world of Laura, I have a thought-provoking question for you. What AI tools do you use these days? Now, this could be any AI tool that just helps in your daily life, productivity, work, what have you. Now, these days for me, I've been actually looking into a tool known as Cursor, which it kind of integrates like ChatGPT along with like a Visual Studio editor. So it helps you write efficient code really cleanly, understand your code base and so much more. I've been recently starting to take a look at this. I thought it was pretty cool, but flipping this question back over to you, like this, do you use any AI tools and are you excited about any of these tools? So please comment down below where I can hear you and let's have a discussion. Now for this video, we're gonna look a lot more under the hood to understand how these models are trained and fine tuned via LoRa. So LoRa is a method of parameter efficient fine tuning and using LoRa for any additional fine tuning task, we can decrease the number of additional parameters used while also speeding up inference time predictions. In order to do this, we have LoRa, which is low rank adaptation. And low rank is a property of matrices and adaptation is a property of, well, adapters. And so we're gonna split this video into three passes where we start talking about the rank of a matrix, what it is and how to compute it. We'll start talking about adapters and merge these concepts in order to understand LoRa. And so with that, let's get started. For this first pass, we are going to understand what the rank of a matrix is and how to calculate it. So the rank of a matrix is the number of linearly independent rows or columns in said matrix. And in order to compute this, we are going to consider columns now in our example for simplicity. So this is our matrix. It's a four cross five matrix for which we want to compute the rank and hence we want to determine how many linearly independent columns exist in this matrix. Now we're gonna take this first column and determine if it is linearly independent of columns that come before it. This is the first column. There is no other columns that come before it. And so this column is linearly independent of columns that come before it. Pretty simple statement. Let's move on now. After put a check mark over here, we'll go to the second column. Now, this second column is also linearly independent of all of the values in the columns that come before it. In this case, it's the first column. So, what we're going to do is put a check mark up there. Now, we're going to check this third column. However, we'll notice that this third column is not linearly independent of the columns that come before this. Why is this the case? It's because we could create this linear equation of the third column in terms of the first column and the second column. So you could see that the values of this third column is essentially one times the value of the first column plus two times the value of the second column. And hence we write it over here as such. This establishes linear dependence. And so we're gonna put a little X on top of this column to indicate that the column is not linearly independent of the columns that come before it. We're gonna now repeat the process for the next column, the fourth column, C4. And here we will also see that this column is also linearly dependent on the columns that come before it. It is a combination of the first column plus the second column values. We will mark this with a cross as this column is not linearly independent of the columns that come before it. Now we'll come to the final column and we will also make the same conclusion as this final column is a combination of two times the first column plus one times the second column. And hence, there is a linear dependence between the fifth column and the first two columns, which come before it. And hence, we put an X mark up here. 
And based on this result, we have two linearly independent columns, and hence the rank of this 4 cross 5 matrix is 2. Now, why does this matter at all? Well, we can now, knowing this rank, take this 4 cross 5 matrix, and let's write this out a little bit more cleanly in terms of the dependence. You can see that C1 is going to be 1 plus C1 plus 0 plus C2. C2 is 0 C1 plus 1 C2. C3 is 1 C1 plus 2 C2. C4 is 1 C1 plus 1 C2. And C5 is 2 C1 plus 1 C2. And now what we can do is we can take our original matrix and we can now write it as a product of two matrices that are smaller. So the first matrix is just going to be the independent columns. That is C1 and C2. We just copy and paste them as is. And then the second columns will be the coefficients that we computed in the previous slide, which would be that 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, and 2, 1. So if you do the math multiplication, the matrix multiplication, you'll get this full matrix. And hence, we've now decomposed the full matrix down into two smaller matrices. And this is really neat because now this 4 cross 5 matrix is decomposed into 4 cross 2 and a 2 cross 5 matrix. And this 2 here is going to be the rank. And if we sum these up, this is 20 parameters or 20 numbers that are stored here. Whereas here, we'll have 18 total numbers that are stored. And so it stores less parameters, less spaces being stored. And what now we can say is, you know, in general, if we have a matrix of, like, say, like a weight matrix, which we will see later in LoRa, of D cross K, we can decompose it into two matrices of D cross R and R cross K. And as long as this rank R is much less than D and K, we will actually store less parameters in this way. And this is going to be very useful for LoRa. It's going to be R, which is our rank of the matrix, is going to be low rank. And if this matrix R or these, this matrix is of a low rank, we are going to be able to use this to efficiently store really small number of parameters when we are trying to fine tune the matrix on a new task. But we'll see this, how it comes into better picture in the future pass. Quiz time. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. What is the rank of this matrix? A, 0, B, 1, C, 2, or D, 3? I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answer is B. But can you tell me why? Give your reasoning down in the comments below, and let's have a discussion. And if you think I do deserve it at this point, please do consider giving this video a like, because it will help me out a lot. Now that's going to do it for quiz time and pass one of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. So in this pass, we're going to understand a little bit more about adapters. So I'm going to be introducing adapters a little bit later in this pass. But first, let's start with the motivation for adapters in the first place, because I think it'll make a lot more sense if I introduce adapters later on. So first of all, let's say that we have an untrained model. Now, typically what we would do is we are going to train this or pre-train this model on a language task. And typically this language task could be language modeling, where we give initial contexts like chocolate ice cream in this case, and then it will the model should be able to complete the sentence by predicting the future word or words that come after it. So chocolate ice cream is not that great. And then after it looks at a few of these examples as such, this now will be a pre-trained language model. 
And now what we can do is take this pre-trained model and then fine tune it on some other task. And in order to fine tune it on some task, one example of doing this is to fine tune it on question answering. So we'll feed it a question and an answer, and then we will allow the model to understand how to answer said questions. And once it does, this model will now be a fine tuned model on question answering, which we can use now for inference and answering questions. So a place that this kind of paradigm of using transfer learning and pre-training and fine tuning is used is BERT, where we have, we pre-train it on, let's say, mass language modeling and next sentence prediction, and then we can fine tune it on a multitude of tasks. One of the pros of fine tuning is that it requires less data as it, you know, we're training model from scratch. But the cons are that it is very time consuming and expensive to train as LLMs are only becoming larger. And then there is the problem of catastrophic forgetting where, you know, because all of the parameters are being updated, the model tends to forget what it learned in the pre-training phase. So you can see that both of these can be linked to the fact that all model parameters are trainable during the fine tuning phase. So how do we deal with this? One way to deal with this is through parameter efficient fine tuning or PEFT. So let's explain the training and fine tuning of BERT with and without parameter efficient fine tuning. So without parameter efficient fine tuning, we're first going to take this dumb BERT architecture, which is a stack of transformer encoders. We are then going to pre-train it on masked language modeling. So essentially you're going to feed it in a sentence with some values that are masked inside. So I love blank to the blank. And the mass language modeling task is going to try to predict what these words can be. So it's going and park in this case. So the model is now going to be trained on that objective. It is also going to be trained on another objective called next sentence prediction where it takes in two sentences and it will determine whether sentence A precedes sentence B or sentence A does not precede sentence B in terms of understanding context. So I love toys and the sky is blue, not related to each other and hence the output would be false in this case. So once this model is trained on mass language modeling and next sentence prediction, we have like this pre-trained BERT model. We then now perform fine tuning. And in this case, let's say that we want to fine tune it on question answering. So we'll pass it in a question and here's a response as a label. And then we are going to make the model learn. And in this case, all of the parameters in this model during the backpropagation phase are going to be updated. Now, let's say that we wanted to fine tune BERT on another task. We would basically take our fundamental pre-trained model. We'll pass it in the um, X, which is the movie was enjoyable, pass in the label, which is going to be the sentiment. In this case, it's a positive sentiment. And during the learning phase, backpropagation has to happen, right? So in the backpropagation phase over here, once again, all of the parameters are going to be updated. And when all of these parameters are updated, they need to be stored somewhere else. So BERT large typically has around 345 million parameters. So for every single task that you want to fine tune on, we need to store 345 million extra parameters. And this is just going to be way too much storage that is used during fine tuning. Now let's actually now try to understand how the fine tuning phase can happen with something called an adapter. So adapters are essentially going to be small units that we add to our network that modify the network or allow it to adapt to a fine tuned task. So in this case, let's just say that we have BERT and that has already been pre-trained without adapters on mass language modeling and next sentence prediction. Now we have added these adapters, two adapters per attention layer or two adapters per transformer layer. And now we're going to fine tune this on question answering. So what we're going to do is pass in the question and here is the label. And once again, we are going to perform a forward pass. And then on the backward pass, when we want to update parameters, we really only update 
the parameters of these adapter layers. And everything else or all of the other weights in the network remain frozen. So the gradients will pass through them, but no parameters are updated. And so what this means is that only the adapter weights, because they're the only ones updated, they're the only ones that need to be stored for this question answering task. And these adapters could just be like feed forward layers and they take very little space compared to like storing all of the parameters of this network. So now let's say that we want to fine tune on another task, which is sentiment analysis. What we can first do is replace all of the adapters first so that they're fresh. Then we can take the input that is the movie was enjoyable and the output would be the sentiment. In this case, it's positive. And then during the back propagation phase, we would only modify these adapter feed forward neural net weights and everything else here is going to be frozen. And because of this, because that adapter weights are updated during back propagation, only these adapter weights really need to be stored. And this is just going to be a fraction of all of the weights of the model. And so these adapters help modify the original architecture in order to adapt the architecture towards fine-tuned tasks, such as question answering or sentiment analysis, while storing only a fraction of the number of parameters. And that's what an adapter is and why they are required. Quiz time. It's that time of video again. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. What is the primary advantage of LoRa over additive adapters? A, the forward pass time during fine tuning is reduced. B, the forward pass time during inference is reduced. C, the backward pass time during fine tuning is reduced. Or D, the backward pass time during inference is reduced. Note that multiple options here may be correct, and I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answer is B, but can you tell me why? Give your reasoning down in the comments below and let's have a discussion. But that'll do it for quiz time and pass two of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. In the previous pass, we took a look at this initial form of a transformer layer where we added two adapters for the transformer layer. Now, a good thing about these, or a pro, is that it reduces the number of trainable parameters per task. But the main con here is that it increases latency or inference time. After all, these adapters are added into the network in a sequential manner. So this can increase the time for the forward pass. So how do we deal with this? And the answer to that is low rank adaptation or LoRa. So here's an image that was taken from the main paper. And here we have this section over here is an adapter, whereas this blue section is going to be our pre-trained weights in the network. So these adapters is added to the pre-trained model, allowing it to adapt to a specific task. Like we discussed before, and hence the name. Now you can think of these actually practically speaking as two feed forward layers where A here is going to be a feed forward layer with weights of shape D cross R and B is going to be another you know matrix of uh, like a feed forward layer of shape R cross D where R is going to be the rank, and D is an internal representation of, um, let's just say a word, or a token in our transformer architecture. You can expect D to be something like 512 dimensions, for example. And R, we're gonna show, could be a very low number, as low as rank of one, or two, or eight here. Now, to construct this adapter, we determine some low rank R. 
And it's these units that are the small number of parameters that are going to be added for every single set of pre-trained weights. And it's going to be a very small set of like the total number of weights, as long as the rank R is going to be much less than D over here. In order to understand exactly what's going on here with LoRa, we are going to understand the fine tuning of BERT with and without the LoRa adapters, kind of like how we looked at um, the additive adapters in the previous pass. So let's say now that BERT is pre-trained on mass language modeling and next sentence prediction. So this is a pre-trained BERT model. And each of these like multi-head attention parts consists of a set of weights, right? We have like query vectors, key vectors, and value vectors. So it's Q, K, V, and hence the weights associated with them we're going to call as W, Q, W, K, and W, V. I've also given superscripts up here in order to indicate which layer they belong to. So for example, the superscript one is the first layer, superscript two is the second layer that we see over here. And this goes all the way up to 24 because BERT large has 24 such transformer layers that are stacked on each other. Now, each of these weight matrices is going to be a shape D cross D. And like I mentioned before, D I think for BERT large is around well, it's it's 512 for probably the smaller networks, but I think for BERT large specifically, it's going to be like 1024. Now, what we're going to do is to every single multi-head attention layer, we are going to attach in parallel certain matrices. So in this case, like the first layer, we're going to say A, Q, B, Q. This is going to be essentially two feed forward layers, A and B, like in concatenation with each other. A, K, B, K, and A, V, B, V. So this is for the query key and value uh, weight tensors. Similarly, for the second uh, multi-head attention, we are going to attach another set of three feed forward layers or three pairs of feed forward layers, which would be A, Q, B, Q, A, K, B, K, and A, V, B, V. But I've um, put a superscript of two to indicate that these are different weights than these sets over here. And similarly, this is the 24th layer, which are gonna be different sets of weights than the ones that we see here, for example. And each of these, like we discussed before, is going to have a shape of A is D cross R, and R is going to be a shape, a matrix of shape R cross D. But in practice, these are like feed forward layers with a very small bottleneck of R. And R we determine to be like one or two or eight, like we discussed previously. And so let's say that we wanted to fine tune BERT on question answering. What that's gonna look like is we pass in a question, we have like a response as a label, and then we have like the normal forward pass, it generates some prediction, we compare it to the label. But during the backward pass, you can see there's like a, it's, it's a messy set of arrows, but what essentially happens is that we are going to update all of these parameters, that is AQ, a, K, A, V for every layer. So it's going to go like this, you know, just trace this direction in order to capture all of A, Q, A, K, A, V so that we update all of these additional parameters that we added on the bottom. But the network layers over here are all going to be frozen. So gradients pass through them, but there is no weight update. So during the fine tuning, all of the A's and B's are learned. And now what we can do is we have those A's and B's that we've learned for every single layer, and we can just do a little bit of math addition or matrix addition. We'll take the original weight matrices, that is the original W, Q, W, K, W, V here, W, Q, W, K, W, V here, etc., all the way up to here, and we're going to add the product of A, B matrices. So in this case, for example, what we're gonna do is, this is a D cross D matrix, right? D cross R, R cross D, so it becomes D cross D. And we're just simply going to add it to the original weight matrices in each of these layers. We add it directly, and we modify these vectors or these matrices directly. So we're gonna modify the matrices WK, WQ, and WV for every layer. And in doing so, now that these are all updated weights, 
we don't need any other additional layer or additional unit. It actually, the architecture is now going to look effectively the same as it did for the normal fine tuning. But what we can now do is we'll pass in like a question during inference time. We're inferring now, we're done with the fine tuning. And this is going to produce a result, which is a prediction for question answering. And we can see that no additional weight parameters were used during inference, right? We don't see any adapters used through inference. And what this means is that because there's no additional weight parameters, there's no inference latency. So that means there's no slowdown in making inference here. Now to understand the effect of like how much this kind of speeds up the process, let's take a look at this table over here. These are like the inference times right here for Laura. This adapter L is going to be the additive adapter case of how was how fast was the inference if we'd use, you know, serially added adapters. And you can see here that, you know, the improvements go for certain tasks from like 2% all the way up to like even 20%. And you can see here that like if you have like GPT-3 with Laura, you can see that the actual accuracy is on par if not better than like even you know using the original adapter or even in case of like the fine tuning case the accuracy is also just as comparable if not even better now in order to understand like what the optimal value of the rank r should be well it could be as low as one and we still get pretty good results that are compared to even higher ranking uh, matrices over here quiz time Ooh, this is going to be a fun one. In Laura, what exactly is low rank R referring to? A, the number of neurons in the bottleneck layer of additional task-specific feed-forward layers. B, the number of neurons added to each attention layer. C, the number of neurons added for each additional specific task, or D, none of the above. Note here that multiple answers may be correct, and I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answer here is A. But can you tell me why? Give your reasoning down in the comments below and let's have a discussion. And if you think I do deserve it at this point, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. Now that's gonna do it for pass three and quiz three, but before we go, let's generate a summary. In this video, we took a look at LoRa, which is a type of parameter efficient fine tuning, and it combines the concepts of low rank in matrices along with adapters. We walk through what is the rank of a matrix and also how to compute the rank of a matrix too. This matrix decomposition is useful, especially when the rank of the matrix is low to decrease the number of parameters that are stored. We also talked about the concept of adapters, which are a set of parameters that allow a model to adapt to a specific task. And in this case, they'll manifest as feedforward layers. We then described how we can fine tune using LoRa and simply use a simple mathematical equation to update the weights based on the A and B matrices that are learned. And by modifying all of the weights in place, we end up with a network that has no inference latency. And that's all we have for today to understand LoRa. Now I'll, ha I'll attach all the resources that are required down in the description below. But if you do think I deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like. And if you wanna check out something similar, do check out this AI related playlist over here. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.